So hang on, we started on beef jerky and we ended up on essential oils. Is that yeah. what just happened? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Good and Basic Podcast, a long-form conversation between Joseph and Joseph about the YouTube channel Good and Basic. So welcome to the program. If you're interested in our social media information, it's all in the show notes and also in the description below. So let's get started. Yeah, so this week we are recapping the beef jerky videos. Beef jerky slash parched corn, right? So uh, two videos about beef jerky. Um, one about some of the, the the cool, let's say the superhero origin story of, of beef jerky. Um, and another one about taking responsibility for, well, about meat safety and about taking responsibility for the for the food you eat and for your own. Uh, culinary safety, let's say. And so we've um, got the history of a couple of very fascinating food products, parched corn and beef jerky, which is like a very physical thing that's very basic. Yeah. And then we've got some good ideas related to personal responsibility and the raw amount of, get it, raw oh, amount of risk <laughs> that's associated <laughs> with uh, with eating your daily food. Yeah, actually there's, there's one thing I wanted to get out of the way just uh, right off the bat, which is a few people in the YouTube comments have asked uh, what my recipe was, how to specifically make beef jerky. Um, so I, I think I'll do a full walkthrough later this fall or winter. I'm like, I, I, I mentioned, I'm kind of on a, on a meat preservation kick. I'm interested in this. And so um, I will be making pastrami, uh, probably some other uh, cured, preserved, salted, smoked, dried meats. Um, this fall slash winter. So there will be more of that. And I think that's when I'll do like a, a video walkthrough. But um, for my beef jerky, I believe in the holy trinity of beef spices, which are garlic, salt, and pepper. Um, so I, I, I pretty much just use those uh, combined with a little bit of liquid salt. Uh, liquid salt, oh dear. Liquid smoke um, to, to, to add some, well, some smoky flavor, right? Um, and then I just, I, I dehydrate in a dehydrator. So, so if you're curious, if you're curious, like what spices I use, those are the spices I use. Um, I believe it's next week or in the near future, we did a collab with the King of Random about making beef jerky. So that will be coming out soon and I'm not going to spoil it, but it will be pretty awesome. More it than will a be little. pretty awesome. More so, than a little. So uh, we'll have a kind of an inadvertent, unintentional tutorial there too. Um, yeah, so those are the spices. Um, th those are the spices I use, uh, and maybe someday we'll do a, a real video walkthrough. Um, obviously, there's lots of other things you can do. Um, honey is a good ingredient. Some people use barbecue sauce. Worcestershire sauce is a great ingredient. Um, soy sauce, if you kind of are going for that teriyaki flavor, uh, and I don't. I believe in the holy trinity of beef jerky spices, just like I said. So, uh, All right. yeah. So, well, that's 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 my recipe. In case in case anyone cares, I was then, surprised by how much interest there was because. There's a million beef jerky recipes on the internet, but well, that's mine. Yeah, and it's good. Yeah, and, and I, very I basic. Confirm. And very basic. Yes. And very basic. So. It is both of those things. Yeah. So, meat preservation. Uh, real quick, you're using yeah. a food dehydrator, so Correct. that is a, a machine specifically developed for the purpose of home food preservation. Correct. Which to me is it's cool that there is such a thing. Yeah. As a as a home mm -hmm. dehydrator, I, I am encouraged that there are companies that are creating products that the sole goal of these products is to empower the individual to then take advantage of take control of their own food supply i mean uh, water bath canners and pressure cookers and all these things that bring that food production into the home and like home freeze dryers yeah that's one of the things that i see in my future eventually yeah yeah well they're their own little pieces of capital right like it's not the most impressive piece of capital it's not like a, a, a giant packing plant or something right um, but, but, you know, these, these, uh, tools and machines that help you preserve food and really all cooking equipment, you know, it, it, in, on, on some level, all cooking equipment is capital goods, right? As opposed to consumer goods. Um, but you know, these food dehydrators and, and other machines that will help you preserve food, uh, you know, it's your own little capital good, right? It allows you to be a producer and not just a consumer. Yeah. So they are really cool. And it's a, I mean, it, it's a truism that cooking your own meals is a good way to save money. I yeah. Mean, Going out to eat is a really good way to spend money. <laughs> Cooking your own food is a really good way to save money. And so it's very it, true. I mean, if you can take advantage of that and take control of that, and this is getting into the, the personal responsibility theme, mm -hmm. but not, not only is there the, the safety aspect where you're going to be maybe safer, but if you can learn to cook restaurant quality at home, mm -hmm. then suddenly your quality of life and cost of living just, I mean, yeah. quality of life went up, cost of living well, dropped. And, and something that's really interesting to me is that there's some of these services uh, like Blue Apron, and I don't know, I, I can't remember the names of the other ones, right? But there are services now that will deliver the ingredients to your home so that you can cook, right? And that's so interesting to me that, uh, you know, 
uh, cooking is a thing that saves money, but it, it's also become a little bit of a luxury good, right? It's also become a little bit of a luxury good. And I think the reason, I think a large part of the reason why people pay for services like Blue Apron is uh, for the quality time with their family, right? Uh, it's strange to me that there food, needs to be a food company and that food does preparation. That. Yeah, I mean, it is, well, I mean, who, who uses Blue Apron and similar services? I'm assuming it's, you know, it's uh, working professionals usually where, where, you know, it's a, it's a couple who are working and maybe they have kids, uh, but they, you know, you do not have a lot of time to go shopping and you just don't want to think about it. But if you can get ingredients delivered to your door, then, you know, it's really nice to spend that quality time. So, so yeah, I mean, it is, it is a little weird, right? And it, it is a little historically weird too, right? Like yeah. at what point in the history of the world has cooking food been a luxury good, right? But it does, it does kind of, uh, point to the idea that food and food preparation have more than nutritional value, that there's something, uh, spiritual, emotional, psychological, social, right. That, uh, there's, there's something more to it than just the nutrition and there's something very healthy and good about it. Not just the eating or the eating experience, but also the preparation experience separate from the eating experience or, or combined with, or in conjunction with, but, but as a, as a part of a larger whole, absolutely. Right. That it's, it's not just about, well, you know, and like you can imagine a hypothetical future where we just eat multivitamins and then something that, you know, uh, inhibits, I don't know what it would do. Maybe it just, uh, you, know, you know, like at some point you could get a pill that just magically delivers all your calories. Soylent. And, yeah. Well, that, right? that was the recent attempt. Turns out there's, you know, nutrients <laughs> that aren't quite in Soylent yet, but there, there uh, it was a drink and you could dispense with eating for... At least in principle, it seems yeah. possible, right? And, and the question is, you know, would you want to live in that world? No. And it's like, well, no. And we know you, well, yeah, I mean, like, I don't, I don't think that many people would, right? And that's why services, like, it sounds like we're advertising for Blue Apron. We're not, I've never used them. I have no idea if it's any good, but that's why services like this exist is, is fundamentally because, uh, you know, food is not just about the nutrition. Yeah. Right. It's about a lot more than that. The, the funny thing about this. Right. Is about responsibility, for example, which is the subject of the Tao of Jerky. Yes. Sorry, where, go ahead. where certain things like work, um, I mean, you can optimize them out of the equation. You mm-hmm. can imagine a future where no one works. Yeah. The trouble is, is that a healthy future? Because we all know people who have retired and then proceeded to slump and then die. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it turns out that work isn't just about, isn't purely a means to an end. There are certain elements of endness in work. Mm-hmm. where you need it for its own sake, at least to a certain amount and at least certain kinds of work. Yeah. So it's not, it's not, you don't necessarily need in your heart of hearts to have a job, but you do need in your heart of hearts to, to have a certain thing that is fulfilled by that thing we call work. To, to be, in, if I could try, uh, try to extract describing it, it then yeah. what I would say is something like you need to be engaged in something meaningful. And an ingredient of that meaningfulness seems to be that it is difficult, challenging, and even maybe a little unpleasant in some respects. And productive also. And, you and can productive, point to yeah. point to the product that you're producing. Um, maybe maybe some of that is filled with cooking. M- maybe that is the same need. Maybe cooking also mm-hmm. supplies other needs, like the social yeah. need you were mentioning. Like cooking with your family, yeah, yeah, yeah. teaching the kids how to cook, transferring mm-hmm. skills, sh- sharing time together. Yeah. Well, and it, it also makes me think, speaking of like bizarrely historic, like uh, bizarrely uh, unusual goods and services and products, uh, historically speaking, I, you know, I also think of exercise, right? Yeah. Where like the idea of going and just going like wasting energy, it's like, what the heck? You're like, going to go <laughs> burn off calories. Like, wh- what? <laughs> Do you have calories to burn? Yeah. Well, and also, you know, uh, you know, we in in most of human history, there hasn't exactly been a shortage of heavy things to lift, and there hasn't exactly been a shortage of places to walk, right? Yep. Uh, Unless you're a member of a very very small class. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely right. I'm um, excluding. And often that class was the warrior class, and so they were the ones going to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and so now it's this bizarrely a historical thing where you know exercise is also a luxury good and i'm like i do not even know what i think about that it's very strange but it seems to be similar to the cooking thing so it's kind yeah. of interesting the funny thing to me about living in a future where uh things like physical work to, to exercise for example and cooking become optional and eventually i mean you push that that trend far enough and we get to a future where more or less everything is optional and that thing the one thing that defines what you're going to be doing is choice, which means the question of what is meaningful becomes, it moves from the periphery where if you have time, that's great, or isn't it fun that these things we were already doing are meaningful? 
and becomes a very conscious hunt toward meaning. Well, and I want to say, this is this is conjecture. I'm kind of developing the idea as I go, but uh, it, it occurs to me that to the extent that there is a crisis of meaning today, which it's not easy to measure that. It's not even easy to define that, right? So I'm trying to be cautious here, but to the extent that there is a crisis of meaning in the world today, you know, is it would it be crazy to say that that's linked to a lack of meaningful work, right? Partially. I think mean, that's something that's something that like the religious right would get on board with. That's something that a lot of Marxists would get on board with, right? And they uh, you know have different takes on that problem and obviously different solutions, right? But, uh, I mean, it doesn't seem like a totally crazy idea to say that the crisis of meaning is partially spurred by, uh... Our relationship with work. Our relationship with work, yeah, fundamentally. Yeah. Uh, slash, yeah, and I actually like that better than saying the work that we do. I was going to yeah. say that, right? But maybe yeah. it's maybe it's our relationship to work, right? To the work we do. Maybe we could do the same kind of work, right? Like, and do it maybe we could zen. approach... Yeah, maybe we could approach yeah. this with the right kung fu. Yeah. Right, like, maybe we could approach this with the right kung fu such that, uh, you know, the the quote unquote meaningless desk jobs that we have would not be meaningless, right? I, I don't know. Conjecture, right? But it's a, it's it's certainly a viable hypothesis and it seems like an interesting hypothesis. It is. I my, my one criticism to that is uh, I I agree with it partially and I I mean so there's two parts to that. One I agree with it and two mm -hmm. partially. Yeah. So the the caveat would be that even when you have really good kung fu there are still limitations. Um range limitations, physical limitations, very real real parameters that you're working with. Mm -hmm. And so some jobs would not be meaningful no matter how much kung fu you threw at them. Yeah, it certainly does seem that way, right? Uh, there, there is an outer edge that you could fall off. And the kung fu increases the squish where you can, can do more things meaningfully. But there will be a, a threshold where... Well, and yeah, and again, this yeah. is why I think the right phrase is relationship with your work, right? You have to be the right kind of person. The job has to be the right kind of job. And given the right kind of job and the right kind of person, I don't know, maybe there's... Maybe in any... Maybe there is an infinite number of theoretical combinations of that. Maybe not. Anyway. Who knows? Anyway. <laughs> so meat, meat preservation and the, your parched corn slash beef jerky diet. How, how did that go? Yeah, you so... You said you were running off the walls. Yeah, I had a lot of energy. And the, the hard thing here is, and I want to reiterate this, and I believe I mentioned it in the video a little bit, right? Is it's just really hard to say anything because it's three days, there's no controlled experiment, right? Like, I haven't even, I haven't even done this multiple times, right? Sure. You know, so not only can I not say that this would work for everybody, I can't even say it would work for me again. You know, like, I, I don't know that. It okay. seems reasonable to suppose that, but I do not know that. Right, but yeah, it was it was really quite incredible. It was really quite incredible. The, the difference was staggering. Um, the difference was staggering. And, and so that's certainly interesting and worth thinking about, especially because of what, as far as I could tell, was, you know, a pretty severe caloric deficit, right? Which also begs the question, okay, Joseph, so what happens when you do that for a week? Sure. Right, does the caloric deficit catch up with you then? It sure seems like it ought to. Sure. Does it take a week and a half, two weeks? This is... A month? This is an know. interesting thing. So you, you weren't trying this diet um, to see if you would survive. We already yes. knew that you would survive. You weren't doing it to lose weight because that's just not a concern that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason why you became interested in beef jerky, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to make a conjecture sure. and then yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, tell yeah, me yeah. if you disagree. Let's do it. Well, part A was you're just fascinated with meat preservation as, mm -hmm. a, as an intellectual problem. Yeah. Preserving food. How did they do that? Yeah. I'm fascinated. Let's study it and learn everything we can. Mm -hmm. But on the practical side, the other reason for you is that you do not enjoy the inconvenience of having to sit down and eat. Yes. So you <laughs> want something that you can grab and so, go. So I'm, yeah, I'm. So a convenience factor. I think I might be a. There's an alternate universe where I'm a better person because I sit down and eat with people. <laughs> and like, but I'm just not that person. I'm. Whenever I eat with people, I am always the first done with my meal. I just. I eat really fast, and I. And I hate. I, I usually hate preparing food and I hate spending time on that. And so my wife and calls so, me the turtle. I have the exact opposite <laughs> problem. I will be the last person finishing the meal at every single event. And that's partially because I like to talk, but I yeah. also like to eat slowly. Yeah. So, so for me, right. I, I kind of view it as an obstacle to overcome in a way, right? Like I might be that person who would be okay with a future that has like soy lint, you know, <laughs> maybe. Right. So, 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 so that's one of the reasons why beef jerky and parched corn are really interesting is because um, they don't require that much prep. You know, you can create very large batches of them in one go, and then you're done with prep. 
and you can carry it anywhere and eat it anytime, right? And that's that's been really nice for me, right? And again, I'm, I'm cautious about recommending that to everybody. I think it works well for a certain kind of lifestyle and a certain kind of temperament, right? And a certain pace of lifestyle, specifically. Yeah, yeah, this is true. I mean, well, and this is, you know, contrasted by like, by let's call it the Blue Apron lifestyle, which is where, no, like you want to set aside that time, right? And I'm not at that, that my life is not like that right now, right? Um, and, you know, it, well, it, it, like I said, it just depends on your lifestyle, right? Like sure. if you're running all over the place, and these are really good options, right? Um, or if you're if you're a very outdoorsy type who's, uh, you know, it's really handy to have lightweight, nutrient-dense food that uh, requires little to no preparation, right? right. And, and no preparation on, on point of eating, basically, right? I, I like to have a few things stashed in my school bag um, that are like cliff bars or, you know, yeah. some sort of granola-like thing. Sometimes it is parched corn. And then... You know, if I get hungry and I happen to have forgotten my lunch that day, which is a thing mm -hmm. that happens more than once a semester, then, you know, I have a backup. Mm -hmm. So that's been a handy thing. Well, and to bump up to a really high level abstract principle right now, um, what, what I've been trying, what I'm trying to do with this is to harmonize across, you know, uh, multiple facets of my life, right? Like there's a facet of my life where I like to go do a lot of things and stay busy. Right, and that's not very harmonious with spending a long time preparing food, right? Uh, whereas, you know, there's there's you know, and there's there's other uh, stages of life and other other types of lifestyles, right? Where it's like, no, like you actually, uh, it would be much more harmonious for you to spend time with people. Uh, talking as you prepare food or eating, or you know, I mean, even if you just really enjoy the cooking process a lot. Yeah, I mean, do, do you agree? Does that sound about right to you? That's that's my take on this whole. I mean, the why of this, right? Yeah, I, is I'm trying to find something that is harmonious with all the other pieces of my life, right? I'm trying to 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 weave one coherent tapestry, and this is one piece of that. It's it's a few threads running through, a few very important threads. If you don't eat, you kind of die. So, yep. Uh, I think this actually relates to to diet in general. Um, I I don't think that doing the same thing always. At, if you take the average of all the things that you should eat in a year and then say that that average, that specific number of all the, the nutrients is what you should be eating every single day, mm -hmm. I think that is wrong. There's also a certain amount of variability that you need between days because not every day is the same. Some day you're on the trail. Other days you are spending time with your family. And so, and sometimes of the year you have massive quantities of fruit because the nectarines are in season, you know? Mm -hmm. And other times, not so much. And it seems like humans would be biologically adapted to that yes. sort of lifestyle. Where Especially since you do have a fourteen hundred pound bison, and so it's like, okay, for about two days here, we are eating a lot of meat, man. It's true. We are eating a lot of meat, the, right? Or when the or when the fruit comes on, right? You, uh, I mean, depending on the fruit and depending how good your preservation is. And also, but, but let me culture. tell you, when the peaches come on, you just do not have much time. No. You have a very small window to to stuff yourself with peaches, which is exactly the right thing to do, by the way. Yep. Yep. Exactly it's true. the right thing to do. Funny thing about uh, meat preservation in medieval Europe is the typical pattern was you would raise, uh, particularly pigs. Pigs make a lot of meat very fast, and they, mm -hmm. they eat garbage, which, which is feeding even, them is easy. That's even true today. My understanding is that uh, pork is still just about the cheapest meat to bring to market. Yeah. At least it is yeah. in the United States. Uh, mileage may vary in other countries. I'm not sure. In terms that. of how much you're feeding them for how much meat you're getting off yep. of them in the end, that ratio is nice. The the rate that they grow is nice. And so tip, very typical arrangement is you take a couple of piglets in the beginning of the year. You raise them all the way through the year. Right around October when all the nut trees, like the acorns, are dropping, mm -hmm. you uh, push the, the – you heard the – I almost said the cows. You herd the pigs into the forest and have them eat all the nut mast. And then uh, you wait to slaughter them until the first day where it's freezing. So you wait for frost. Oh, really? Yeah. I actually did not know. I, I mean, I knew the rough timing. I didn't know it's It's, it's November-ish. It's mid-November. Mid and that's the day that you slaughter the... It's when you do Is that butcher. like hard frost? I know we get light frost in September here in Utah usually. And uh, we get hard frost... I think by late September or October or early October. You want it to be consistent enough that the meat won't spoil. Ah, so, well, I mean, you're, you're gauging the weather. You're hoping yeah. that an Indian summer isn't going to rob you of your meat. Huh. And so at that point, that's when you do the slaughtering. That's when you drain out the animal. And that's when you process them because yeah. you, you have a refrigerator. It's called the seasons. Yeah. And so meat is traditionally meat and starch. I mean, that's what gets you through the winter. Mm -hmm. And then the only meat that you're really eating in the summer is small game, if you're lucky enough. 
and stuff that you'd ride and preserved, um, mm -hmm. like summer sausage, which is the dry kind. Yeah, and so, summer sausage. Yeah, and so there's times of the year where you're eating mostly uh, pottage and salad, and there's times of the year where you're eating mostly gruel and meat. Mm -hmm. And so, so from a dietetic perspective, this is all uh, taking aim at the view that, well, you should have exactly this amount of vitamin A 365 days a year. And yeah. what you're proposing is, well, actually, maybe it's that you should be having a very high-fat, high-protein diet for a little while and then be moving to... Uh, at least that we ought to explore in that direction. Yes, and that there's variability as an element of good yeah. diet. And there are some studies that have been playing around with this, but frankly, it's too soon to, to say too much. But my gut says, uh, my gut says that that would be a good thing <laughs> to do. So... Uh, you Always know. listen to the gut, unless the gut is telling you lies. In which case, I'm trying to remember which ignore. which scientist it is that 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 thinks this. I'm trying to remember. So, to so, so I apologize for not sourcing this properly, but there's there's a guy who did research on chimps, and he thinks uh, apparently chimpanzees have very very large guts, and the reason why is because they eat leaves, and it turns out that to get nutrition out of leaves, you need a lot of gut. Um, but his his theory is basically that humans traded guts for brains, right? Uh, that is fascinating. No, not a bad exchange, right? Yeah. Uh, not a bad exchange. Um, oh, I, I was thinking this is kind of interesting in terms of my three-day experiment because uh, something very interesting happened. So the first day I did not eat very much. The second day I ate a lot more, and the third day I didn't eat very much again. And, and I think the first day I didn't eat very much because uh, it, it, it's not, I mean, you want a little bit of variety in your diet. I was, I, I wanted something besides parts. You were bored. Right? I was a little bored on the first day, right? So the boredom is well, what determines how just, much you're eating. There's just, I, I'm hypothesizing on that first sure. day, right? Because, you know, your body doesn't really need it yet. And it's like, oh, I don't want to eat more parched corn. It's like this powder, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, and that's true. No matter how salty it is, you're just, you're done, right? Yeah. Um, the next day I ate a lot. I ate quite a bit. Um, the third day I didn't eat very much. And the reason was because the third day I was insanely busy. I was running all over the place, doing all kinds of things. And, uh, you know, I didn't even have time for parched corn and beef jerky. But the really interesting thing is I was 100% fine. Yeah. Right. And so um, there, was a, there was a comment on, on that video where somebody mentioned that they were eating, a, you know, a, a pretty simple, let's say a basic diet, right? That apparently is good for them, right? Uh, it, it seems that way, right? Um, and, I, I, and they mentioned, one of the things they mentioned is that uh, they don't seem to have cravings, right? They just, they just eat however much they want and then everything seems to be fine. Right. And I thought that was really interesting because uh, even uh, even though I didn't eat m that much that third day and I was going like crazy, I had plenty of energy all day. Like everything was fine. And so like um, I wonder sometimes and maybe it depends a little on your lifestyle and what you like. You know, if you're Epicurean, maybe things change a little bit. Right. But uh, that maybe we're putting the cart before the horse with nutrition and it would be a lot better if we sort of listened to our bodies and paid attention to what diets work for us rather than saying. I need X, I right? And, and I and I want to be careful with that because, yeah. you know, like I am very grateful for nutrition as a science. I am very glad that we figured out the vitamin C cause, or uh, cures scurvy, right? Like I'm I'm so glad for, for, for lots of this whole, science. Yes, yeah. this is all very nice, right? But uh, I, I don't, I, I am hypothesizing that it would not be wise for that to wholly replace your gut, let's say. Well, this, this gets into the personal responsibility thing yeah. because what we're doing with science is... Uh, is taking data from large bodies of data. Yes. So we're looking across an entire population to say, okay, on average, what is going to make you healthy? Things that isn't taking into account are idiosyncrasies. So if you are unusual, and you are, um, then in some ways, the average isn't going to describe you. And so it, it's a mixed blessing where the average is incredibly powerful for telling us, generally speaking, what we mm -hmm. can expect. And that is what science is very, very good at. Statistics. Yeah. Statistical analysis is very good at. But, uh, I mean, it breaks down as soon as you're dealing with an individual, not a population. Yeah. And so, it's, 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 it's what the, does it's your the body kryptonite need? of statistics. Yeah. Is that individuals may vary from the group. They just, they just do. Yep. Right. And statistics acknowledges that. I guess it's better to say it's a kryptonite in the way we use statistics or the way people tend to understand and apply statistics. Where it's taken to be an absolute uh, axiom rather than uh, a generality. Yes. So a I'm really, generality. I'm really glad you brought that up because I want to talk about that. But first, I think we need to tell everybody about Audible real fast. Because um, Audible is awesome. Yes. We're actually really happy to advertise for Audible. If you go to audibletrial.com slash good and basic, you can get a free one month trial, including your own free audiobook that you get to keep even if you cancel the trial, which is a pretty darn good deal. 
uh, you know, how do we love the Audible? Let us count the ways. The, you know, uh, one of the things the Audible is amazing for is the fact that you can learn while you're driving. You can learn while you're making a Wing Chun dummy. I was listening to audiobooks while I was working on the Wing Chun dummy, right? Like, uh, you know, while you're making your beef jerky or parched corn, you know, you can turn on an audiobook. And you can turn on any kind of audiobook. You can do fiction. Um, you can do uh, business books. You can do self-help and personal development. You can do history. You can do science. You can do politics. You can do all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Absolutely anything. And as a result, it allows you to reclaim your time and be learning through your ears while your hands are busy. Yeah. That's a tremendously cool thing. Yes. Yeah, it is, right? It, while it, driving, while making. I mean, they're, they're, that's a lot of time. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's a huge amount of t- time that, like you're saying, has now been, you know, reclaimed. Right, yeah. which is a really cool thing. All hell the the digital revolution, right? Uh, Audible for the win. Um, I, I I like Audible. That that's a product worth using. So if you want to use our code, it's a help support us. It helps support Audible, and it will help support you too. Yes. So win win win. Yes. Uh, this yeah. is a game that's good to play because everybody benefits. Right? <laughs> yes, it is. audibletrialcom slash basic. I wish I had a good book on dietetics or nutrition to recommend, but that is not an area of Audible that I have delved into. So you might have to go figure out that one. On one book own. which touches on it ever oh, so man. slightly. Oh Here we go. Is, oh, this is good. <laughs> is called Anti Fragile by Nassim Taleb. Okay. And so in that one, he he talks about variability and uh, basically it's a book about how uh, how do we deal with risk. The central premise is we. As of, we fundamentally can't predict everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, even even statistics has this problem of not being able to predict individuals, and so uh, there are some very fundamental epistemological, statistical, and other reasons why, and psychological reasons why we just can't predict the mm-hmm. future. But we have to live and make plans, and plans require us to predict the future, or do they? Mm-hmm. And this book, it sure Fragile, seems like they do, right? It Could sure you... seems like they do. Uh, this book, Anti-Fragile, is about how, how do you do that? How do you reconcile mm-hmm. these two problems? How do you live in a world where risk and unpredictability are fundamental things that are unalterable? And how do you how do you win yeah. in that system? And and Nassim Taleb, even even when I feel like I don't agree with him, he's still a thoroughly, like, he's one of the most thoroughly interesting individuals alive in my It's opinion. a very entertaining so, book. He's not, so he's, 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 not worth, he's worth picking up. He's worth picking up With the establishment. Sure. Um yeah, actually, it's fun to talk about. My brother is doing an econ PhD right now, and uh, it's it's kind of interesting to talk to him because he kind of likes Nassim Taleb, but he's like, you know, he's he's insulting my profession a lot. I'm not sure how I feel about that. <laughs> so, okay, well, anyway, so audibletrial.com slash good and basic. If you're interested in that, let's uh, get back to dietetics now. So uh, the thing you were mentioning, right, that... Uh, Individuals vary from the group and personal yes, responsibility. Yes, yes. So this is, this is one of the most interesting things to me because it seems like... You know, I know a lot of people, and I'm assuming that you, the listener, know a lot of people. I mean, this seems to be very true, at least in the United States, and I'm assuming it's truer. It's it, it's similarly true in a, in a broader context. I'm I'm not sure exactly, right? Um, but there's a lot of people who seem to have some very specific uh, dietetic needs, right? Very idiosyncratic diets, and uh, this is true on like you, you know allergies are this on one level, yeah, right. But then there seem to be other levels. Um, I, I know a few in individuals, including a couple people in my family, who like they, they seem to just have very idiosyncratic diets, and some foods seem to really mess them up, right? And and it's taken them a while to figure that out. And and uh, and nutrition and dietetics professionals are not always that helpful in solving these problems. They're yeah. not always, and so a lot of these people who I talk to, they'll they'll have had like years long stories where they're trying to figure out why their body is responding in certain ways to certain foods. Um, and, and, you know, it, it runs the gamut from, you know, very mainstream uh, scientific professional advice down to, like, incredibly foo-foo weird stuff. Sure. Right? And it runs the gamut. It runs the full gamut. But I just think that's such an interesting uh, that's, that's such an interesting phenomenon to materialize now where, you know, it, it certainly seems like science has advanced so far. You know, that seems almost like a truism, right? And I'm like, well, this is really interesting that sort of the mass solutions are not working for a very large number of people. For yeah. a very large minority, let's say, but still a very large minority, right? And now it's not at all uncommon, at least where we are. I mean, it, it probably depends on your locale a little bit, right? But to to go into a restaurant and find gluten free options, right? Lots of allergy information, right? Um, all sorts of things. And like then this. there's ethical ethical uh, reasons to vary diet as well. I yeah. Mean, so th- there are 
there are those who uh, go and become vegetarians, for instance, or vegans, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, for health reasons. My yeah. father-in-law was one of those. Um, he had some medical conditions and on the advice of a doctor uh, tried a vegan diet mm -hmm. for a while. And then there are those who do it for ethical reasons because mm -hmm. they believe that it's wrong to, to kill animals. And mm -hmm. probably the beef jerky series this week was hard yes, for them. Yes, you know, if you are a vegetarian um, or a vegan listening to the, this, uh, well, <laughs> thank you for listening to this, I guess, because that's not the funnest thing, maybe. But uh, yeah. Well, but uh, hopefully we can all live together. You know, uh, I, I have respect for that, though, uh, particularly uh, the amount of internal consistency that it takes to mm -hmm. say that something is wrong and then live it. Yeah, not, not the cool. easiest thing. That's a not cool the easiest thing. thing. Yeah. So um, kudos. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I, I absolutely. No, I agree. Um, something else interesting, you know, now that I've touched on this, I guess I'm, I'm just going to stick my toe in this in the water now, and I'm only going to stick my toe in because this is. Uh, there's some controversy here, right? And sure. But um this also seems to be true for for medical. Oh, uh, interesting. Issues, yeah, yeah. Right. That um there's a lot of people experimenting with alternative medicine and it ranges the gamut from, you know, fairly mainstream stuff down to let's say stuff like acupuncture that has a very long history but it's still a little weird and foo foo, at least you know, to 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 my mindset certainly, and to the mindset it, it of many people have listening good, to this podcast. It doesn't have a good. It doesn't have an easily. It, it, it doesn't. The metaphysical explanations for it, the the mechanism by which yeah. it works. So, do do. So there, there's two models where you can look at it. the black box model, where we stick the needles in the right places uh -huh. and we feel better. Yeah. We can see that you feel better. That yeah. works. Mm -hmm. But the mechanism, uh, at least hypothetically, the mechanism in that black box proposed with with chi paths and yeah. meridians and all this stuff doesn't Starts, reconcile very well it, with our. It does not fit well inside Western inside the Western scientific materialist paradigm. It just does not. And then with with diet, you also have the problem of you know uh, placebo, and that goes in both directions. Where I know. you you something is wrong, so and eventually you, you your mind latches onto this idea that it's this. And if somebody sneaks it into your food, well, it doesn't affect you. And and um, my my favorite strange like I was talking with uh, somebody about the placebo effect once, and, and this person was very indignant about it. Right, and they were saying, well, we were talking about some form of alternative medicine, and she was saying, well, it's, you know, it's probably just a placebo effect. And I was like, well, I don't know if it if it the placebo effect works. It seems like that's still like that still Worth works, using. right? Yeah, yeah. like. So even I if mean, it's if a black it, box. Yeah. <laughs> even, you know, even if, let's use more placebos then, right? Yeah. Like, if a placebo can cure cancer, then cure cancer. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying. Uh, yeah. If, in it, those cases where Assuming work. that works, then... Well, if it works, then it works. Um, yeah, and so these things can run the gamut all the way from, you know, things that seem to fit nicely inside the Western scientific materialist paradigm, roughly speaking, uh, and are just a little unusual, you know, like recommending a vegan diet, let's say. Right? Sure. All the way to like to again like chi paths, essential oils, and energy healing. Sure. Right. And so, so that's another interesting phenomenon. That is, it's similar in uh, medical issues as it is to dietetic issues, where there's a lot of people who are exploring around the edges, right? For better and for worse. For better and for worse. <laughs> and th that's an interesting for thing. For better and for because worse. If you make decisions about diet and health. These, these are big deals. Yeah. I mean, well, this you is can your life. mess your life up yeah. bad. You are taking your life in your hands. Let's say that you are like Emperor Qin Shi Huang from the Qin Dynasty in China, and you decide that you're going to experiment with your diet and health by drinking liquid mercury and powdered jade for the secret to immortality. Yeah. Um, you, you could mess yourself up pretty bad. Yeah. Um, so th there's a risk element, and maybe if you're a medical professional listening to this, you're thinking, oh my goodness, people should not be controlling their own diet and uh -huh. doing their own medicine and looking on WebMD and convincing themselves that they yeah. have all these things <laughs> because have all they're the going to do it wrong and the consequences of doing it wrong are terrible. So yeah. you might mess yourself up, and that risk is too high, and so you uh -huh. just shouldn't muck with it yourself. And why is that wrong? Uh, yeah, well, it's wrong because you should be taking responsibility for these things, right? Like, you should... It, it, it's, it's hard... No, two reasons. First of all, um, it's better for individuals to make decisions assuming the same quality of decisions. I'm assuming that's, that's, that would pretty well be so accepted if, as a truism. if the quality of decision was the same and the medical professional didn't have to do yeah, it, look. there's lower transaction costs, it's just cheaper, it's Correct. better all the way around. Correct. So it's better for the system and better for the individual. Um, yes. Here's another reason is distributed decision making is not that bad of an idea, right? Like if you have tons of people uh, making dietetic decisions... Uh, that allows you a lot of experimentation, right? That allows well, you a lot of... It's a massive, uncontrolled observation study. Yes. Um, so well, you're you exposing yourself to that. higher variation, right? 
uh, than you could ever get from a handful of medical or dietetic professionals, right? So there's much less rigor, but there's higher variation in experimentation. And depending upon your situation, if you're living in a situation where, you know, I mean, I mean, this, like this is, this is my feeling about, uh, you know, if you're if you're facing a problem, a dietetic or medical problem, and you do not know the solution, and you've run up against a total impasse, right, where you're like, we do not know what to do next. Like, if you don't know what to do, any potential solution is at least in principle as, as good as any other potential solution. Because you don't have a good framework for deciding what's yeah. going to be the best solution. Exactly. You've already tried the best solution. So you need to expose work. yourself to variation. You need to expose yourself to risk. Variation right? and risk being the same thing. Positive, yeah. yeah, because you can't tell the difference yet between the solutions and the non-solutions, right? You know, what do you do when you don't know what to do? Well, you try something. Yeah. Right. And so the more people trying something, at least in theory, right, there's, you know, your, your experimentation, the number of experiments you can run goes up. So that's one, that's a second positive thing. Um, third positive thing, uh, honestly, if it works for you, then it works for you. You know, it's, it's kind of like the placebo effect, you know. Uh, so, so I'm a big believer, again, in, in the Western scientific paradigm and in the dietetics and medical science that it's given us, right? But, but part of me says, look, if you go to your energy healer and your energy healer does I don't know what, and you come out better, I'm like, is, is there a problem here? It worked. Yeah. Now, would I want to understand it better? Yes. Absolutely. Would there potentially be better solutions? Yes. Absolutely. But it's very hard for me to say, what you're doing works for you, but I'm still going to forbid you to do it and tell you not to do it because it doesn't fit with my understanding of things. I'm like, no, that, that is a point. That is a point where where Western scientific professionalism has gone beyond its proper bounds and has become tyrannical. And here's a... Yeah, tyrannical is a fascinating word there, and I, I think it fits. I think, I think, I think it's exerting power in a domain that does not belong to it. It is trying to claim responsibility out, outside of its competence. I mean, it's trying to Outside take, of its proper domain of responsibility. Take more responsibility than it should over someone else. Yeah. And, I mean, it's not mm -hmm. just the power over, it's the responsibility over. If you are claiming that you should not be making that decision... That is tyranny, if it extends beyond. One, one thing that I want to ask asterisk, you... Asterisk, 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 but yes, absolutely. One thing that you mentioned in the Dow of Beef Jerky is the Safe to Eat video was the, um, was the fact that you had read the USDA recommendations mm -hmm. and you knew what you were getting into. Yeah. And so one of the things that, as you're claiming personal responsibility, clearly, um, clearly there are times when you need assistance from someone who knows more than you do. Specialization is still a valuable thing. Oh, absolutely. So, one of the major tricks here, and this is where your where your research should. This is one way of articulating how your research and understanding and relationship with responsibility should go. Gosh, that was a sentence to get out. Um, this is what I'm thinking: is is to understand the bounds of your competence and to say, make every decision that you possibly can, and make yourself more competent so that you can. But be aware of where the boundaries of that competence are, so that you can make the call of when to seek outside help. Mm -hmm. So example being, I, I snap my femur into three pieces on the side of the road. I can't stitch that myself. It's I, not I like, would not recommend you go to an energy healer. <laughs> no! No! Well, well, and I, I, sorry, I picked energy healing, parenthetically, I picked energy healing because to me it seems like kind of the outer bounds of foo-foo-dum. Sure. Right, and so it, it works well as an extreme example. Anyway, so, so that's why I picked it. I, I, I'm trying to distance myself from the issue as much as possible for all the reasons that I've already outlined. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. your femur. So my femur. Um, at that point, what they what they do is uh, surgery. I mean, you need someone who knows how to cut into a human body and make changes that aren't going to cause more harm than good. Mm -hmm. And so I had a, a fantastic surgeon who uh, put my foot in a basically a ski boot attached to a winch and oh. cranked it to get my... Because my femur had snapped and then compacted in this way. Unfortunately, oh. I'm unconscious for all this. Thank heaven for modern medicine as far as knocking me unconscious goes. Um, and then what they did is they, they uh, lined up all my bones, all the pieces of bone, and then rammed a rod of titanium through all of the segments to keep them aligned. And then I had a cast on the inside. Mm -hmm. Some titanium screws go in, and then I was able to walk six weeks later. In Which any, is insane. Any other century, I would have lost the leg and probably my life due to the infection after the amputation. So, I mean, there's there's something there. But at the same time, I mean, I, I've I've gotten some benefit out of uh, out of the black box foo foo stuff like the essential oils. So, 
I mean, you can't throw everything out, but you do need to understand the outer boundaries and you need to be competent enough to recognize the limits of your own competence. Yeah. Well, and this is, you know, now that I'm, you know, playing as you're doing right now, playing devil's advocate to the, to, to our own ideas, I guess, basically. <laughs> this is a healthy um, thing. Yes. This is a good thing. No, so, so Western scientific professionalism, let's say, I think definitely can and does stray into the boundary of, 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 of tyranny, of improper assumption of responsibility. But, you know, it's also worth saying, look, you know, you said in any other century, death or at least amputation. Yeah. Right. Probably it, both. The fact that they can make you walk six weeks later is insane. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Right. And so, and so, I mean, this kind of goes back to your, the value of hippies video, right? Um, where. Just because I think there are limits, there's flaws in the system. There are, there are You do not want to throw system. that thing out wholesale because it can, it can put together somebody's leg. Yeah. And, and anything that is that powerful, you do not want to count out of your calculations. You just don't. You or just put don't. people on the moon. That's the classic example. Yeah, goes. you know, <laughs> classic example. It's only been fifty years since we did that, but we did that. Yeah. So you can't throw everything out. So I mean, statistics break down when you're dealing with individuals. <clears throat> that is a fundamental mm -hmm. and, in some sense, unalterable flaw, and it's a flaw. It's a real flaw, or at least a limitation. That's probably one of way the to say two. It. Yeah, I, a limitation, something like that. So a, a less than complete thing. Yeah. So this is this is a blind spot. Yeah. But. It still sees many things clearly. Yeah, it's very dangerous to think you're an exception to the rule. Yeah. And and so responsibility. I mean, your your femur is an excellent argument. Right? <laughs> it is. I mean, uh, yeah, not a, not a showstopper. Very, very but convenient close. Uh, exhibit. Speaking of showstopping, we'd probably better wrap this up. Yeah. Um, so hang on, we started on beef jerky and we ended up on essential oils. Is that yeah. what just happened? Yeah. Okay. All right. Can you use essential oils to flavor beef jerky? Uh, <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and with that, I think we'll close that off. You know, that's a, that's as good a cliffhanger as any. So thank you so much for uh, for watching and listening. Uh, we sure appreciate interacting with you. Um, and we'll see you next time. Yep. <laughs>